You are listening to the audio lecture for Nursing Fundamentals Fall 2015, covering Chapter 23 on Safety. Safety is the condition of being safe from undergoing or causing hurt, injury, or loss. And of course, safety is a basic human need that we all have. And it's very important that we understand and utilize safety practices when caring for our patients. Nurses attend to the safety needs of clients in all healthcare settings, as well as their peers, healthcare, other healthcare workers, and themselves. There are some developmental factors that affect safety, and you look at all of the different um, age groups when we look at this. We start out with infants and toddlers. What affects their safety? One, they can't recognize danger like the rest of us can. They have that tactile exploration of environment, so they're always wanting to touch things and pull at things and um, go towards plugins and outlets. And they are, of course, totally dependent on our care um, to be watching them at all times. Preschoolers, their play then extends to the outdoors, so it puts them more at risk because of all of the outdoor play, and they are more adventurous. School age children, they like to try new activities without practicing or thinking that they need to have any um, assistance. They want to do everything on their own. They spend more time outside of the home. And of course, stranger danger is introduced in the school age child of understanding that there are strangers and that we shouldn't be speaking to people that we don't know. In adolescents, many adolescents have that false confidence. It will never happen to me. Yes, I realize that those things could do exist for others, but they feel indestructible that nothing will ever happen to them. And they do do a lot of risk-taking um, activities. They have a lot of risk-taking behaviors that exist. And a lot of adolescents just lack that adult judgment. As an adult, we then become exposed to workplace injuries and our lifestyle choices that we take on can impact our health. Alcoholism, smoking, um, chewing tobacco, um, street drugs, things like that. And then there's also a decline later on as an adult in our strength and our stamina. And in older adults, we have the loss of muscle strength, joint mobility, slowing of reflexes, and sensory loss that all put them at very high risk for safety concerns. Question. In meeting the safety needs of the adolescent client, it would be most important for the nurse to focus her teaching on A. Smoking cessation B. Sports injuries C. Alcohol abuse or D. Driver's education The answer is D. Driver's education because this is the leading cause of death in adolescents today. What are some individual factors that affect safety? If you look on page 654 in your textbook, it talks about some of them. Lifestyle is a risk factor. Um, some of the manifestations um, in behavior here are smoking, alcohol abuse, and risk-taking behaviors. Our cognition or cognitive awareness. Some confusion, possibly due to stress and the loss of short-term memory. Our balance, gait, and mobility can be issues due to loss of senses, vision, hearing, pain, so on and so forth, um, which help, help to provide that first line of defense. Impaired communication, language barriers and hearing, and speech impairments related possibly to disease processes. Impaired mobility, like I said, impaired strength accompanying problems with mobility, balance, and endurance. Emotional health, both physical and emotional well-being. The reduced physical stamina and depression with feelings of loss of control and helplessness can play into it. And then overall safety awareness, just a reduced cognitive awareness um, and immature in the adult and then um, immature development of the child. Now we're going to go into a lot of the safety hazards in the home and we're going to talk about those safety hazards themselves and then what are ways to prevent those um, safety hazards from occurring as well as in some of them we may talk about the treatment procedures that we may utilize if we encounter these safety hazards in the healthcare field. The first one we talk about is poisoning. Poisoning due to different household chemicals, possibly lead, 
uh, medicines in the cabinets, cosmetics, things like that, that a lot of times these would be things, of course, that children, toddlers or um, smaller children would get into. The prevention, of course, cabinet locks. Store the poisons high and always have poison control number accessible so that you can call right away to find out what kind of treatment. The treatment is going to depend on the type of poison that was ingested and um, we may want, depending on what it was, if we want to promote um, emesis or vomiting or if we would need to pump the stomach and depending on what was ingested whether or not it would cause more damage by coming back up. One of the antidotes that are utilized is charcoal um, which does induce vomiting. Next is carbon monoxide poisoning, and this is going to be produced by burning fuel, um, gas, wood, oil, or kerosene. The prevention, a carbon monoxide detector, making sure that we have those working in all of our homes. And the treatment of a carbon monoxide poisoning, if they were to come in, is going to be 100% humidified oxygen. Scalds and burns is another. We can have scalds and burns through hot water, grease, cigarettes, and even sunburn. Prevention, make sure there's guardrails by the fireplace. Make sure you turn pot handles in when they're up on the stove so the little toddler can't reach and pull it down. Only light your candles when you're home. Wear sunscreen when you're outside. And um, be careful when you're warming food in the microwave not to burn or cause a fire um, due to that. Fires um, could be cooking fires, smoke inhalation, um, and home heating equipment is also important to take into consideration here. For prevention, make sure you have smoke alarms, and not only that, but you're changing the batteries at least once a year. There's also making sure we take caution with cigarettes. Uh, fire extinguishers that are working in the homes. Never leave those candles unattended. Holiday season's coming up. Make sure we take care with holiday lights that there isn't a short and take care with electrical cords and even if you have animals that could possibly be chewing on those cords make sure cords are always intact uh, if you're going to be leaving anything plugged in. Falls. With falls we want to be um, really careful especially in adults over the age of 65 who are going to be at higher risk for a fall and this would probably be due to something like slippery floors, stairs, um, getting in and out of the tub be due to the um, um, wet a lower toilet seat, having to um, both one squat way down and then having to try to stand from that low position. And possibly a high bed would also put someone at risk. Prevention. Wear non-skid shoes. Tidy clothing, meaning not pants that are dragging on the floor. Proper lighting to be sure that you can see so you don't trip over anything. Using grab, grab bars and rails in the bathrooms. And then no scatter rugs. Um, especially elderly like to have rugs everywhere and those can get caught up and uh, you can trip over them so it's important. Firearms injuries, um, both youth suicides, domestic violence can come into play so for prevention of that firearm safety education for both parents and children. Be sure that we have properly locked store cabinets for guns, gun cabinets. Um, make sure you keep that key in a safe place uh, away from the cabinet and also keeping ammunition in a separate place locked away from where the guns are. Suffocation and asphyxiation. Um, this could include drowning, choking, or smoke and gas inhalation. Here um, most at risk is going to be children uh, from newborn to four years of age. It's important that we watch for small removable parts, that we cut food into tiny pieces, for example hot dogs. Pay attention to um, babies' mobiles it's like on, um, and cords, like on mini blinds. The cords, there's been in accidents where children have wrapped that around their neck and um, asphyxiated that way and choked. Uh, plastic bags. Um, apply a barrier to a pool to not allow a child to accidentally fall in. And one thing, know the Heimlich maneuver. Make sure that you know that um, so that you can assist if need be for choking. Um, safety hazards in the home, um, also again some take home toxins, um, both pathologic, um, pathogenic, I'm sorry, microorganisms, asbestos, lead, mercury, and arsenic, 
Um, but be aware of workplace prevention measures to keep from tracking those things home. Uh, remove your work clothing before you go home, or some people will remove it like out in the garage before they walk in. Shower if appropriate and necessary before being around your family members, and use gloves. Question. A child has had hiccups for two hours. Is this a sign of suspected ingestion of poison? True or false? The answer is false. It is not. Safety ha more safety hazards, motor, motor vehicle injuries, um, some causes, failure to utilize their seat belts, the use of alcohol, pedestrian accidents, and then non-deployment of the airbag. Prevention, avoid distractions. Cell phones, text messaging, loud music. Always have a designated driver. Always wear a seatbelt. And of course, make sure proper age-dependent restraints are utilized for children. Make sure we're using rear-facing um, we're facing child seats, booster seats, and such, and make sure you understand the laws and regulations in regards to those um, if you have children based on where you live. Community acquired pathogens, these could be foodborne or vectorborne. So, foodborne prevention, make sure you've used proper storage for all food, that you clean and cook it appropriately, that you clean your cooking surfaces, not just with a washcloth, but actually use antibacterials and um, pay attention to um, different folk remedies. Vector-borne prevention, um, drain standing water, use insect repellents, protect your skin uh, against contact with insects, and try to get rid of any breeding areas um, that you know uh, to stay away from. Pollution is another safety hazard, both all of the above, air, water, noise, and soil. So prevention is proper disposal and recycling of solid waste, utilizing environmentally safe products, carpool, and use public transport if at all possible, and utilize earplugs and stay away from loud music. Electrical storms is another safety hazard, and the prevention here <clears throat> is to, during a storm, seek the lowest place possible, lowest spot possible. Um, Seek shelter in a large building that is far away from water. And do not use metal objects. So don't go out golfing in the middle of an electric storm. All right. Safety hazards in healthcare facilities. Falls. Um, falls is one of those big ones that we're working on all the time and preventing them. So we're doing, we're doing prevention through adequate fall risk assessments. We're keeping our environment safe um, and clean. Um, dry floors, and we're educating our clients on the proper use of call bells um, and things like that in relation to safety. There's also equipment related accidents that can occur, fires and electrical hazards. The use of restraints um, definitely can cause some concern and making sure that you understand the rules and regulations for restraints. We are definitely not using them anywhere near what we had in the past. Um, if they are ordered, they are only ordered on, on 24 hours um, intervals and the physician has to be in to see the patient and they have to rewrite it every 24 hours. If we have a patient on restraints, we need to be in that room looking at that patient, um, assessing that patient, offering um, to be released from the restraints um, at least hourly, if not more often than that. But it's going to be very frequent checks. Every 15 minutes or so, somebody is peeking in to make sure that patient's okay. The use of side rails, only three at a time at the most. Otherwise, it is considered a restraint. Um, and then mercury poisoning. And the prevention of that is going to be a yearly facility training um, and making sure that the policies are up to date. On page 657, there is... Um, Box 23-2 talks about the Joint Commission 2011 safety, uh, patient safety goals, and these are updated. Um, goal 1, improve the accuracy of patient identification, and this is something we always talk about, to patient identifier. Goal 2, improve effectiveness of communication among caregivers, and we enacted the SBAR system in order to do that. Goal 3, improve the safety of utilizing medications, including anticoagulants, and what we're doing there is having two RNs verifying some of those higher-risk medications. 
Goal seven, reduce the risk of healthcare associated infections. How? Hand hygiene. Um, you, um, to make sure we're protecting against multi-drug resistant organisms. And we're also taking a look at central line bloodstream infections and surgical site infections and enacted some policies and procedures for that. Goal eight, accurately and completely reconcile medications across the continuum, um, continuum of care. Um, medication reconciliation is something I talk about in pharmacology. This is where we reconcile or we look at their home medication list, what they were taking at home, and then we compare it to what the physician has ordered to make sure it's all lining up. So when they go home, we have pulled all the different med lists together and made sure that we reconciled and gave them one list um, to go home with to make sure we're not missing anything. And then goal 15, the organization identifies safety risks inherent in its patient population. So identifying your own safety risks within, risks within your facility. Um, so, just some other um, issues and concerns to take a look at. The other thing I want to mention is um, what we call never events um, and also near misses and making sure that you understand what all of those were. Um, some things that we always want to make sure uh, that we're taking a look at as we provide care are foreign objects such as sponges that are left in the patient after surgery. Okay, that could cause serious injury or death. An air embolism. Um, and when we start talking about central line care um, with IVs, you'll understand more about what that is. Administering the wrong type of blood. So we have policies and procedures in, in, in place to make sure we don't do that. Um, pressure ulcers. We make sure we're turning every two hours and that we have um, padding on the beds or air pressure um, beds that change that uh, for the patients. Falls and trauma, we want to prevent those. Infections with urinary catheters, making sure that we are cleaning um, and that they're being put in using sterile procedure. Infections with IV catheters, making sure they're being changed adequately so that it doesn't happen. Um, symptoms resulting from poorly controlled blood sugar levels. Surgical site infections. And then DVTs, or deep vein thrombosis, or pulmonary emboli. And this is um, when you start taking care of patients in the hospital, you'll note that we use those sequential compression devices, SCDs, um, or TED hose on their legs um, to keep the blood flow moving to prevent um, DVTs from occurring. And you may also see that they're on prophylactic Lovenox, an anticoagulant, um, in a small dose to keep from having any issues there. Question, when implementing the use of restraints on a hospitalized client, the nurse should A, restrain all confused clients so they do not sustain a fall injury, B, tie the restraint to the bottom of the side rail so the client cannot reach it, C, ensure that the primary care provider renews the order for restraints once every 24 hours, and D, release the restraints and provide skin care at least once every shift. The answer is C. Ensure that the primary care provider renews this order for restraints once every 24 hours. So A, we do not restrain confused clients because it actually increases the risk for injury. We do not tie the restraint to the bottom of a side rail because if that side rail gets pulled down, um, it could cause further injury. And we release restraints and provide skin care every hour, not every shift. Safety hazards for healthcare workers, it's important to note that we are all at risk for back injury. Make sure you're using the proper lifting procedures and protocols. Make sure you're getting a second person to help you or use the lift systems that are in place, the equipment that you have instead of using your back. Needle stick injuries. Um, make sure you're utilizing these safety devices properly to avoid being stuck with a needle. Uh, radiation injuries, making sure that you're protecting yourself and staying away from the potential for radiation. Uh, workplace violence, so this is more mental. A safety hazard, um, play nice in the playground. Um, and through prevention, proper body mechanics, sharps awareness with proper disposal, radiation precautions, and then environmental awareness of your personal safety.
that ends chapter 23 on patient safety. If you have any questions, please make sure that you bring them up. Thank you.